and welcome to Dash School. I am your teacher, Amanda B. Johnson, and this video series is going to provide you with a complete and basic understanding of how a blockchain works, as well as how Dash uses one, and how Dash in general works and serves as a digital cache. This series requires no special pre-knowledge on your part and is intended for everyone. With that said, let's get started. So, speaking of digital currency, how could such a thing exist? How could I send you some bits over the internet that would somehow be interpreted as money? Well, let's think of something we're all familiar with, email. So how about this? Could this email, which states that it represents one e-money, be used to buy things that cost one e-money? Technically, it could. If enough people started passing these around and ex accepting them for goods and services, this would be a primitive sort of digital currency. It wouldn't be a very good one, however, in that I could do this. If I had sent you this e-money for, say, a subscription to your weekly blog, thanks for that, I could also send that very same email to my friend Sam, to my cousin Bob, and to my neighbor Mary. Now, all of a sudden, where we started out with just one e-money, we now have four. Poof! New e-moneys were simply created out of thin air and I could technically do this as many times as I wanted. You can see how this is problematic because it means that our money supply can be rapidly expanded in a completely unaccountable way. If I can create as many new money units as I want, this currency would be what's called infinitely inflatable. Why wouldn't we want unlimited, unpredictable inflation? Let's consider gold for a moment. You know, that really valuable metal shiny rock. What would happen if, say, an asteroid were to hit the Earth that was made of gold and suddenly increased the available supply of gold by a trillion? So that there were gold coins lying around everywhere you look. You wouldn't even be able to step out your front door without kicking over a pile of gold. If gold were as common as pebbles, do you think people would still be willing to trade, say, oh, a car for an ounce of the stuff? I don't think so. In the same way that gold would be devalued if its supply were increased by a trillion, same goes for money. Kind of like this. As the supply of money increases, the purchasing power, or what goods and services each individual unit of that money will get you goes down. As an example, in the United States there used to be something called penny candy. That was because one penny would buy you a piece of candy. Now, a lot of people simply throw their pennies away in the trash can because it will no longer buy them anything. If any new monetary system is to be considered worthy of your attention, it's got to not be like that. So going back to our email example, that, how could we ensure that anything digital is not infinitely inflatable? Is the digital realm, after all, not the land of copy and paste? Yeah, like that. To prevent the copy and paste problem, inflation, from taking place on our special email money, e-money, what if we tracked every email that was sent on a kind of ledger? Like this. And what if we built a kind of wallet software that read this ledger? So if I tried to send you two and a half e-moneys, my wallet would know that I only have one. This concept of a digital ledger makes up the entire foundation of digital currency, or as some also call it, cryptocurrency. And that foundation has a name, a blockchain. 
And now you can be confident that anytime someone drops this fancy word around you, all they're really saying is digital ledger. But if it's a digital ledger, why call it a blockchain? What does that mean? Well, it has to do with how this ledger works. Going back to this concept of a ledger, the most important thing we have to make sure of to make sure that our monetary supply is open, honest, accountable, auditable, we have to make sure that the numbers are trustworthy. How can we make sure, for example, that I don't do something like this? Wouldn't that be convenient for me? Or how do we make sure that I don't do something like this? Alice never should have crossed me. Well, the answer is that no one gets to change the ledger. They only get to update it. Let's shrink this down. Here's that shrunk down copy of our ledger, and it's time stamped. If we want to change who owns what, we have to add an update. And on and on, so that any time I, you, Bob, Alice, or anyone using the e-money system wants to send some e-money, it gets included in an update. After a bit, you start to see where this digital ledger gets its name. Each update to the ledger is called a block, and the cumulative result of this is a chain. Hence, blockchain. Now you might be thinking to yourself, hmm, that seems like a novel way to try to do money, but who gets to make entries into the blockchain? Uh, when do they get to make entries into the blockchain? Any old time they want? And why should we trust that people making entries into the blockchain are making accurate entries? Well, my friend, that you would even wonder such a thing it tells me that you are clever enough to have a complete understanding of all things blockchain and digital currencies. So why don't you hop on over to episode two to find out the answers to your questions. So the state in which all or the majority of the network agrees on the same versions of the blockchain is called consensus. And it is from consensus that a blockchain running network achieves most of its security.